You are listening to Females in Fantasy, a podcast elevating the voices of women authors of science fiction and fantasy who write about kick-ass heroines. I am your host, Brianna Da Silva, and this is episode five. And today I am joined by Jeanette Ng to talk about how othering and racism can sneak into fantasy and sci-fi, and how she turned this on its head in her very weird Victorian Gothic novel, Under the Pendulum Sun. At the time that I'm recording this intro, I have finished that book, and let me tell you, it is, well, (laughs) it's very weird, and I actually really recommend it. So without further ado, this is my conversation with Jeanette. Welcome, Jeanette, to Females in Fantasy. How are you doing today? Good morning, since it is morning both our places. It is really funny. We are, what are we, like 13 hours off of each other? Am I doing that math right, or is it the other way around? It's like 11 a.m. for me, and then it is just after midnight for you. Where are you actually right now? I'm not sure I know exactly where you are. I am actually in Hong Kong. Oh. Um, It's where my parents live and where I spent the majority of my childhood, I suppose. How old were you when you came to the UK? The UK, yes. I was 16. I went over for my A-levels. It was boarding school. It was a stonking good decision. (laughs) Um, My parents had separated and um, I was bouncing between two two households. So uh, I I really wanted to, to get out. (laughs) I can understand. Okay, so we are going to talk today about your book that came out, how many months ago was it? Well, we're recording this in January, but it came out- October. October, October, okay. It is a- um, It's a Halloween (laughs) book. Yeah, it definitely is a Halloween kind of a book. It's a Gothic Victorian fantasy called Under the Pendulum Sun. I am actually currently reading it right now. I haven't finished it yet, Um, and I'm enjoying it a lot. (laughs) It is, it, it kind of reminds me of like a more fantastical version of Jane Eyre. Um, and I found that I don't like reading it before bed because I literally get creeped out. <laughs> There's so much mystery to it. It's a lot of fun. So I wanted to ask you first, what, what was your initial inspiration for the story? And uh, how did you first get into writing? Well, the first spark of inspiration for the story was, um, I was doing my undergrad degree and I was wandering through some back end of the university library and we came across these old missionary manuals, um, literally Victorian books, which were written for missionaries to prepare them to missionary life, I suppose. Um, and being bored undergraduates that we were, um, we started reading them to each other. Um, we, we didn't have TV back then. This was back when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Uh, for, for, those, for those who live in the, don't live in the UK, um, we you need a TV license, basically, um, oh. to have a TV. Um, so there, there's no free TV in that sense. So um, so we, like all students, foregoed that, and, um, and we would read to each other. We are massive nerds. Um, and it was amazing, because these books would, you know, would talk about bringing the faith to people. Um, and the way they wrote about um, these people, who we know, obviously, are people, um, uh, in in these ways that were fundamentally made them semi, seem inhuman. Um, <laughs> massively racist, in short. And that was sort of fascinating. I was living with an anthropology student at the time, um, who were very good friends, and we, we talked a lot about these sorts of... Um, about missionary work, about faith, about syncretism, which is um, the when when two cultures meet and you start kind of mixing elements... Um, basically. And, and at some point, something sparked about the idea of it would be really interesting if, to me at least, if these missionaries would go and meet people who weren't people, who were as alien and otherworldly and strange as they seem to think the Chinese were, or, you know. Um, and, and a lot of those passages did eventually make it into the book. If you read under the pendulum sun, a lot of the opening passages, the excerpts, are taken from actual missionary manuals. I've changed a few words, um, usually just human or Chinese or um, whatever, into fairy. But um, other than that, um, yeah, that's how they thought about people. Wow. It's a really an interesting twist on that bit of history. It's, it's always kind of fun to to experience things that happened in history, but then with a fantastical twist. I really feel like it helps you see things in a clearer light, which which seems almost counterintuitive, right? But fantasy is really good for that. I'd like to think it, it refocuses the mind to draw attention to things you you otherwise might not notice, especially when it comes to something like um, the Victorian historical fiction, which is 
for various reasons, become very cosy. I mean, the way kind of the BBC loves to do these kind of very cosy adaptions where everything is kind of nice. Um, especially Jane Austen has that reputation of being a very cosy story rather than one that is actually scary or traumatizing or eerie. Which is why I, I love Jane Eyre as, as an aside, um, because it's definitely really different um, from a lot, of, a lot of period pieces like that. This is actually a great segue into another question I had. Um, I'd love to explore that idea of othering a little bit more. Well, first, like what were some examples, if you remember off the top of your head, of uh, some of the things that were in these missionary manuals that felt kind of othering um if you if you want to if you want to share that one of my favorite passages which makes into the book is the one where they kind of basically say uh, the chinese have two eyes two ears a nose and a mouth and all the particulars that you would expect from a human and and it, it kind of goes on to describe them in a very kind of and you're like well yes duh what else were you expecting kind of and you know this is and it's not that it's not that they're saying they are inhuman, but with the tone of voice that they describe their seemingly human characteristics, they suddenly make them not. And and I, I of course, as I say, I, I rip off this passage wholesale. And that sense of making something familiar unfamiliar because you expect to see something else, um, that sense of disquiet makes it into the book. Um, one of the Fae, I don't know if you've, you've re reached that part of the story, but um, one of the Fae actually says to, um, to Kathy that humans are obsessed with the other, that they, they see people and they don't, instead of seeing people as they are, they see the other there. Um, and as the world expands, um, um, she says that, that instead of seeing the other in the next village over, you see them in the, across a border, across an ocean, um, and that this other is, is the fae, that, that, that the humans keep projecting them everywhere. Um, and, and so she, you know, she kind of, kind of um, makes this very narcissistically about herself, because you know, the, the, the person speaking is a fae, and she's like, well, you, know, you see us everywhere, you want to see us everywhere. Um, but, you know, that idea kind of come, come, comes in again and again in the book. Yeah. What are some ways that you think speculative fiction, particularly fantasy, since that's uh, the genre that this book is in, um, can help with us to, I guess, to recognize othering that we may be doing ourselves and to combat that, I guess, with humanizing people? Yeah. What are some ways that you think this genre specifically can accomplish that? One of the ways, I suppose, um, to answer your question in reverse is it, it loves allegory. Um, it really loves allegory, where it loves, you know, instead of talking about people of different skin color, let's talk about orcs and elves. Let's talk about flying people and burrowing people. Let's talk about drow. And it's it's problematic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, to say the least, Um so, so the, sort of the easy answer to give is, oh, well, you know, we could, we could create these allegories and fantasy um, to explore these dynamics. Um, so we don't have to, we can sidestep talking about real people and kind of transpose the issues into fictional, fantastical races um, and explore the issues there, which to an extent is partially true. But it's also often very unhelpful because you are creating an other um, and elves and orcs and whatever are fundamentally biologically, physiologically different. Um, you know, um, it's, it's only so far you can make a coming out allegory out of vampires because vampires literally drink human blood. I think you have to be very careful, especially when dealing with othering and how people um, talk about that sort of thing. And sometimes the allegory and all the fantastical trappings kind of get in the way. Which is to say that my book is not secretly about Chinese people in any way, shape or form. It's about othering and about, about colonialism. But the point is that you, you take, you give them that dark mirror and put them in an uncomfortable situation, them being the missionaries, rather than necessarily um, confronting them with any actual human other. Stepping slightly outside of fantasy, I, I love the example of uh, District 9. Oh, I haven't seen that yet. It's really good. I need to. It's like high on my list. Essentially, um, not trying to sprawl it or anything, 
Um, it has in it, um, it has a use of, of a certain alien race who become refugees. And a lot of people, especially kind of geeky nerds, love to start discussing what the aliens are like biologically and certain traits that they have, such as they like, they seem to really like eating cat food. And, and other such traits, or like they, they seem to raise their children in a certain way, or they hide their eggs in a certain place, or oh, they seem to have a biologically imp imperative to reproduce, or do they have a queen, is that why they seem so lost and forlorn? And I think a lot of that discussion misses the point that they're refugees, um, and them being lost and forlorn isn't so much that they're clearly a hive mind species and their queen is dead. <laughs> it's that they're refugees and they probably have some kind of horrifying PTSD of being stuck in a spaceship forever and um, starving. They seem to like cat food quite possibly because it's the only hygienic food that, you know, human food they've had, they've, well, not human food, but food that they've had, they have their hands on and, and all these things, which as much can be seen as a, a reflection of their circumstance and that they're not actually other in any real biological way beyond the physical because they are they look like bug people but the fact that they do look like bug people makes people start assuming that all these traits about them um, are fundamental and biological or even cultural at least rather than something that is a byproduct of their unusual circumstance being refugees stuck on a human planet, um, living in tent cities and being very much abused by the um, the agencies that have been put in charge of them. And, and I think there's a very interesting conversation to be had there about how, the, how much the allegory does or doesn't muddy the waters and whether or not it has been able to engender more or less sympathy. And so I'm always very wary um, of trying to tell stories that way because... The, the fantastical means that things become, metaphors become literal, but once metaphors become literal, they become literal, I, I think is the very tautological way of putting it. Yeah, it's a, it's a delicate balance, right? Where you, sometimes when you're um, talking about in like fantasy or science fiction, a literal different like race of, you know, humanoid creatures, sometimes you're like crossing this line where it's like, you know, we're trying to make the point, obviously, that, that that's not the case <laughs> in our real world, that there aren't like these distinct biological different races, right? Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's like, it's an interesting balance there um, that I, I feel like can definitely go wrong, but can also go really right. It's, it's, it's tricky. It's interesting. I'm going to change gears a little bit. Um, and since this is Females in Fantasy, where we often talk about um, main characters, um, tell us a little bit about the protagonist of Under the Pendulum Song. Well, Kathy, um, Catherine Helston, is, um, she's um, the sister of um, Laon Helston. Um, he's a missionary. Um, she isn't. Um, and her, she's, she's very close with her brother growing up, and he's now gone missing. And she's off to fairyland to find him. She's been compared to Jane Eyre a lot, um, for good reason. She has that same kind of restless spirit. She has a passage where she, she looks to the horizon on the roof, which pays perhaps excessive homage to Jane Eyre. And obviously she's also stuck in a big house full of secrets, much like Jane Eyre. And she's, she has a relatively sharp scholarly mind. She, she kind of gets embroiled in translation and a lot of kind of theological conversations in which she holds her own against her brother. I mean, I, I suppose that th those are all not exactly the most exciting elements of any heroine. It's kind of interesting. And again, I'm not like super far into the story, but I, I've enjoyed seeing some of, there's just like a, a few hints to some of the I guess, limitations that would have been placed on, on women at that time in her culture. And I can see like, she, she sort of, uh, not quite resents it. I don't know if that's, if that would be the word that you use, but, um, there's some interesting tension there where, you know, she's definitely very intelligent, um, and I would say brave, um, character. Um, but she kind of, she, 
yeah, like they're like they're. It's a little bit. It's a little bit sad to me at the, at the beginning. Some of the things that her brother are able to is able to do and study that she's not exactly able to do. What were some of the things that you enjoyed most about writing her character? I enjoyed a lot of her repression <laughs> to write about, and I love a lot of. I, I like writing how um, some of her kind of sharp dialogue. I always like. I always love writing about theology. So she has these long rambling conversations, um, which which I quite like. I love layering on a lot of double meaning with in terms of her her repression and how she she's trying very hard to be content with her life and what she's been given, but she she isn't, and and that that's quite difficult for her. And and like you know any good gothic heroine, she's just this bundle of this time bomb of desire that um, that that's that the story kind of unravels because that's that's how these things go. Um, I suppose I'm always a big fan of that kind of um, young woman, big house dynamic where delving into the secrets of the house delves into her own secrets and all that kind of excessively pretentious mirroring. I, I, I enjoy that a lot too, obviously. So the world the world is very interesting. Arcadia, am, am I saying that correct? The the world of the Fae? Sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> sure. Yeah. You're like, sure, that sounds good. Uh, um, what were some of the, what was like the process that you went through um, when you were developing this world? Um, and like, what were some of the like influences that inspired you to create it? And was there anything, because I'm sure there's like a mix of, um, you know, like barring from, like pre-existing mythologies versus like inventing some of your own. It's like, what was the, what was the process there? Well, first and foremost, I wanted to be, to be very weird and other, um, and strange. Um, a lot of decisions kind of boiled back down to that. I think to an extent, there's a desire to make the fame make sense. And, and both within the story itself, they are asking that people are trying to make sense of the fame within the story, the book. Um, and, and I think outside of the book, um, we we have a habit of, and I think you know, partly because we're all nerds and we love categorizing things, um, that we want to to make sense of it. We want to, to write little dictionary entries for every type and subtype of fairies and and ta- categorize everything. And I wanted Arcadia to be a place that that defied that, that defied a desire to make things make sense. But equally, um, there is a logic to Arcadia, um, and Victorians really liked making microcosms of things, um, um, like watches, like clockwork worlds, I suppose, within clocks and um, and these kind of dioramas. And it's part of this um, the sort of scientific idea of trying to make sense of the world. And Arcadia both is and isn't that. So you have the pendulum sun, which is kind of, you know, it's in the title. Um, Arcadia is itself in some ways a clockwork world. It is this um, miniature box where everything has a place and everything has to be manually done by the fairies. Um, but they, they cheat and they hack it and, and things go, you know, funny. And that, that all ties into how the origins of Arcadia, which is a bit of a spoiler, but um, but it, it is this kind of um, this world where the Fae have to kind of do everything, and um, and a lot of that obviously comes from um, folklore, where you have kind of fairy characters um, who who kind of make snow or uh, Jack Frost who paints um, frost on your window panes. Um, they they make a they make a, a brief cameo um, and, and things like that where where natural weather phenomena are attributed to fairy um, origins. And and that, and I thought, oh, that'd be really cool if, if the entire world worked like that in fairyland. And so we have some of that. And obviously I also think that everything under the sea is just really cool. So we have a lot of fishy, fish-based things. Um, I don't know if you've encountered the whales yet, but they, they make an appearance I haven't encountered them yet, but I did see the, um, I did read the, the, the quote that was giving me a little bit of a foreshadowing. I was like, oh no, what is this? <laughs> yes. Um, so, so, you know, that, that's, I, I, I think the sea is cool. Um, so that, that comes in a bit. Um, and there, there are quite a lot of, um, uh, I pull some things from medieval folklore. Um, uh, I pull some stuff from Sir Orfeo, uh, which is, a uh, Orpheus and Eurydice uh, retelling from the Middle Ages. It, it's a it's a 
romance, I suppose. Um, but Sir Orpheus was obviously Orpheus, and he goes. His his wife um, uh, is abducted slash dies when she's you know snake. You know the Orpheus and Eurydice story. But instead of going to the underworld, she's taken to Fairyland. Except Fairyland is also the underworld, and it's interesting. <laughs> this what is Fairyland? Um, and obviously, there's a lot of um, there's a lot more stuff about the idea of it being this in between space. And Tamlin, for example, um, is another source for this kind of thing. Cool, cool. Well, I am really looking forward to um, finishing this book and getting all these questions answered because there are I have a lot of questions right now. <laughs> Too many. Um, well, thank you so much for um, joining me today. Where can people find you? Um, I'm on Twitter a lot. And that's just my name, Jeanette with two N's underscore N and G. Um, I'm currently holding a red lightsaber in my in my profile pic, I suppose. I, I also um, semi-regularly write um, a blog, um, which I don't update enough on Medium. I know the feel. I have a blog and I also do not update it enough. <laughs> I'm going to um, recommend you all definitely should follow uh, Jeanette on Twitter. I really enjoy the um, long and informative threads that you write occasionally about, I don't know, you've written about a lot of different things. Some were like related to world building and history. Um, anyway, they're, they're a lot of fun. So you all should follow her. <laughs> My favorite was the one about makeup and magic, probably. I don't think I saw that one. Uh, I'll send it you. Yeah, please do. Please do. Uh, it, it's just the whole, the whole concept of makeup being related to magic and witchcraft. Oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. Poisoning, lots of poisoning Ooh, people. all the poison. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. Thank you again. And uh, I will see you around. Bye. Bye. And that concludes my conversation with Jeanette Ng. Before you close off, because I know some of you probably skipped the ending to podcasts, um, I just want to let you know that if you are looking for Jeanette on social media, um, because of the nature of how I launched this podcast, I had to like record a lot of episodes um, before it launched. I am actually releasing this three months after I recorded it. So her profile picture that she mentioned is now different. So she, her profile picture will look a little bit different, just so that you're aware. Um, if you want to keep in touch, you can follow Females in Fantasy on Twitter at Females in, that's letter N, Fantasy, um, where once a month I hold a um, Twitter chat about uh, different topics of representation in um, speculative fiction. And recently we had a really cool uh, Twitter chat um, that was uh, co-hosted by a couple ladies, and we were talking about um, biracial representation. Um, and fantasy and we had a really good turnout and it was really fun. Um, so the next one, in case you're wondering, is going to be, well, it's going to be at the, um, the fourth Saturday of every month. Um, so you can just keep that in mind. You can also email me at femalesinfantasy at gmail.com um, or follow me on Twitter at Brianna underscore Da Silva or see the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash femalesinfantasy. A little preview for next time, I'm going to have Sarah Elkins on the show to talk about asexuality, which is a identity that doesn't get nearly enough representation, almost none. I'll see you again in two weeks. Thanks for listening.